darkness, humidity, more darkness. You have been wandering in these caves for days now, searching for the legendary hammer of Lambda, and you found nothing so far. You enter a large room of typical dwarven architecture. In the distance, beyond rows and rows of pillars, a bonfire flickers, illuminating a tall archway and the silhouette of a creature that appears to be standing up. What do you do? What do you do? Do you take your bow and shoot an arrow? Do you sneak in and try to see what that creature is? Do you just run away? Do you try to talk to the creature? There are many, many things you could do. So this, is like the, this little snippet is a, the, uh, is a good representation of what happens in what people call a role-playing game, or RPG. Uh, RPGs have really two elements. The first one is uh, you need a story, you need an epic adventure, things happen, like in Tolkien. Uh, and, uh, so you, you need an epic adventure is the first component. It's all about storytelling. The second part, which makes it different from reading a book, from watching a movie, is that in a movie you're just forced to see what one uh, person decided should happen. What makes RPG fun is that you get to decide. Do you want to attack? It's your choice. See what happens. You want to do something else? You do whatever you want. So now, at that point, uh, you might be wondering two things. One is like, who is this person? And two is like, this conference is called NDC, and the D is not Dungeons and Dragons, so why would I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons? So first thing, my name is Matthias Brandevinder, you can find me on Twitter, all these things. And usually people know me for two things, one of them is uh, F-sharp, and the other one is machine learning. That's usually what I talk about, but uh, last year, I got to uh, fulfill a childhood dream. Like when I was a teenager, I wanted to uh, play Dungeons and Dragons. I got all the rules, I knew everything, and I never found anybody to play with. And so this was one of these things where uh, I just crossed it as something which would never happen. And then uh, decades passed, and uh, about a year ago, a friend of mine told me we should play Dungeons and Dragons. And so at that point, I had completely given up. Uh, and uh, I started running a campaign, and so we've been running a campaign for almost a year and a half now, and it's been tremendously fun. Now the other thing which happened is like being a software engineer, uh, of course I did two things. One is like I thought I need to automate this, so I started to build tools in f -sharp to actually automate some of the parts of the game. And the other side is uh, being also a bit obsessed, so if you have played Dungeons and Dragons, the rules are pretty thick. And so I thought is like one way I can check if I understand the rules is like how about I implement them. If the rules are clear and I get them, I should be able to write them down in code. So I've been spending like, uh, I thought it would be a couple of weekends projects. I have been uh, on this for about six months now. I'm nowhere close to being finished, but it's been very fun. And it turns out that the type of thing you've been doing actually are pretty similar to what I would be doing in general with f -sharp when I'm doing mo domain modeling. And so I thought, how about I take this example and uh, share some of the tricks I've seen or some of the patterns I've been using. So let's dive into it. The campaign will be broken down into four arches. One is like, uh, I assume, so I discovered that most people who do software engineering actually play Dungeons and Dragons, so I assume most of you do, but I'm still going to talk a bit about what is the game. Second part is like, I'm going to be talking about modeling monsters with f -sharp. Third one is I'm going to take uh, the problem of rolling dice and look at what you can do with a, with a language like F-Sharp to, uh, mo uh, uh, to model like a rolling dice. And finally, I'm going to show something I've been doing, which is like trying to build a simulator for uh, uh, Dungeons & Dragons combat using Fable and Mesh. So, first, let's start with the rules on Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, uh, the game, or like any game, is about agency. So agency is about giving an actor the capacity to do something in an env environment. That's what games are about. And there are two things which make a game interesting. It's like uh, the game needs to have consequences. Like if you make decisions and nothing happens, or it's always the same, it's not a game and it's not fun. So you need to have a, a decisions which have results. And if you want to have fun in a game, uh, you want to make it such that if you take a decision, if you're smart, good results happen. If you're not smart, bad results happen. Like you want to feel like you're, when you're smart, like good things happen. So for this, you need rules. So uh, Dungeons and Dragons is one of many role-playing games. Uh, I found out that it was published first in uh, 1974. I didn't expect it to be that old, so it makes it like almost 50 years old. Uh, the game has been going through many, many iterations. Like the uh, rules I'm going to talk about are fifth edition. Uh, I think there have been like 11 or 12 editions since the first one. 
Uh, it's the first role-playing game, as far as I know, and the universe is uh, Tolkien-inspired. Somebody actually corrected me on the internet, because that's what people do on the internet, and they told me, no, it's actually inspired by uh, Conan the Barbarian, which is true. I didn't know that, so if you really want to be uh, nitpicky, like this is Conan. So the rules, uh, the core rule set is what people call the player's handbook, or PHB. The player handbook is like 360 pages, so this is kind of what you need to go through to play. Technically, it's not completely true. If you want to play for free, there is a set of basic rules uh, online, which is 180 pages, but th that's still pretty thick. It's a good big specification. Now, if you want to really play seriously, you will probably need three books. The PHB, 316 pages, the DMG, uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, 300 plus, and the uh, Monster's Manual, also 300 plus. So now we are talking about like a spec or rules which are like over 1,000 pages, which is probably uh, related to the fact that I'm still in the middle of it six months later. But so this was, a, yeah, this is what you need to play. Uh, in actual play, uh, there are a couple of things to know. One is that you have two big roles. One role is uh, the player. So the player is like you, you want to have an adventure, and you are around the table, and you just essentially describe what you do, you react to events. For this to work is that you need somebody to represent the world. So uh, the world is represented by the dungeon master or the game master, and that's the person who describes you what you see and what happens when you take a decision. And during the game, you have really two phases. Uh, one phase, which is, a, uh, I would call, a role play. So role play is the most interesting part, in my opinion. This is uh, the part where uh, you focus on interactions. You talk to a dwarf, uh, you, uh, you, you talk to other characters, like uh, all that type of thing. The second piece uh, is a combat. So whenever you have combat, and the combat happens plenty, because, I mean, if you have seen the Lord of the Rings, it's like there is plenty of combat. Whenever combat happens, uh, it turns into a simple war game with very rigid rules. You have turns, a turn is six seconds, during the turn you can do certain things, and things follow very clear rules. Uh, so uh, my focus, or my main focus here, was on, uh, on combat. I think it's the least interesting part, but also like trying to model role play, creating stories, creating dialogue, is something which is really difficult with software. So as a software person, it's like normally you try to automate the dumb stuff, the mechanical part, and that's combat. So this was my focus on this project. So let's talk about domain modeling, uh, uh, domain modeling in that context uh, with F-Sharp. So, I, as I mentioned, is like, uh, you, you want to have agency, so you want to make decisions, and you want to be informed when you make decisions. So, if I told you now you're in a tunnel, and you have one of these two creatures in front of you, the one on the left is a goblin, it's tiny, uh, it's probably a quick, uh, and the one on the right is an ogre, like it's a massive thing, which is like eight feet tall. Uh, if I told you like you have the thing on the left or the thing on the right, you should probably take different decisions. Uh, one of them is probably going to crush you, the other one is probably much less threatening. So how do you model these differences? The way this is modeled in Dungeons & Dragons is by using uh, what's called the stats block, and so it's a little sheet of paper which describes in numbers what you need to know about the creature uh, to represent it properly. So, uh, first element is that you have what's called abilities. So, pair the PHB, six abilities provide a quick description of every creature, physical and mental characteristics, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. How would I model this with F-Shop? I would use something which is called a discriminated union. A discriminated union essentially says, like, uh, I can have an ability, so that's my type, and my ability can be one of six things. It can be either strength, or dex, or con, or int, or width, or char. So that's it. Like, now I have my abilities modeled. How do you use abilities? So each of a creature's ability has a score, a number that defines the magnitude of that ability, again, from the PHP. How would I use this? Uh, so what I'm really saying here is that whenever you have a creature, the creature will have strength and dexterity and intelligence, all these things together. So this is where you use uh, something called a record. So a record here is going to be, a, uh, you can think of it as an immutable class. I'm saying whenever you have a creature, you're going to have scores. I'm going to have one field for strength, one for dex, one for con, all of them will be here. The six of them will be here. How do you work with uh, these two things? Now, if I ask the question, what is the dexterity for my goblin? I would use what's called pattern matching. So I could, for instance, write a function called score. Uh, to give you an answer, I need two things. I need to know what ability I care about and what scores the creature has. And then I would pattern match. So you told me I want a certain ability. That ability can be only one of six things, because that's what I told you that was. So I'm going to match and say ability can be strength. If it's strength, I'm going to do this. 
or its dex, I'm going to do this, or con, I'm going to do this, and so on and so forth. And here, in each of the branches, what I'm doing is I'm saying, if you wanted strength, I'm going to go to the scores and give you the one which was labeled strength, and so on and so forth. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, take this, and depending on the six possible shapes, I'm going to do something different, give you an answer. What do you do uh, with uh, scores? Uh, what you do is you compute modifiers. So modifiers describe, like, are you exceptionally strong or exceptionally weak? And technically, what you do is like, each ability also has a modifier. To determine the modifier, subtract 10 from the ability score and divide the total by 2, round it down. That's trivial. I will write a function, which is called a modifier, where if you give me a score, I'm going to score minus 10 divided by 2, take the rules, write them down, this is done. Cool. And at that point, is like I'm completely ready to represent my goblin. Now, on the left, I can create a record which is going to represent this is what the goblin is uh, from a stat standpoint, so it has a strength, dexterity, and so on and so forth. And I could now retrieve uh, the dexterity of the goblin by saying uh, something like this. Give me the score for dexterity for the goblin, and then like, uh, compute the modifier of this. That's one way I could do this. You probably all have seen something like this. Like, uh, yeah, function call. Another thing I could do, which is kind of nice on the F-sharp side, is that you could use the pipe operator. And what the pipe operator does is like, it takes the thing which is on the left and pushes it as an argument to the function on the right. So here, what I'm saying is that uh, if you give me a goblin, I'm going to quote unquote push the goblin into the score function. So I'm going to say score for dexterity for the goblin. That's going to give me a score. And then I'm going to take that value and I'm going to push it to the modifier function. So it's kind of nicer because now I have a, a function which looks like do this, do this, do this, do this, done. Good. Uh, so, uh, all I described to you so far was really two things. One thing was uh, discriminated unions, and the other one was records. Uh, I could uh, describe this using a term which sounds much more fancy, or much more maybe uh, pretentious, and uh, that's known in general as algebraic data types. If you go to Wikipedia and you look for algebraic data types, you will find the following definition. It's a kind of composite type formed by combining other types. Fine, like, that's a definition. Uh, the, uh, the two types we saw here are known in general as sometimes and product types. So discriminated union is what's it, uh, sorry, discriminated unions is what's known as a sum type. I think the, a good way to think about it is that you can think of it as an or type. Anytime you have a statement which sounds like or, it's probably a discriminated union. Like an ability can be dexterity or strength or intelligence. It's a strong hint that what you want is a sum type. By contrast, the product type which is like uh, the record or maybe the tuple, is an and type. So whenever you have a statement with and, like a creature will have dexterity and intelligence and charisma and, 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 chances are what you are after is a type which is a product type, which is a record. And at that point, is like uh, you got your first adventure done, you can level up, you know what algebraic data types are, so level two, let's move on to the next part of the campaign. So now I'm going to uh, go a bit deeper into the stats block and revisit other sections. And the section I'm going to be focusing on is the piece on the bottom, which is about actions, attacks, and all of that. First thing is like in general, is like when uh, one value which I hold dear to uh, to my heart is like the idea of a ubiquitous language. So in, uh, the idea being like whenever you write code, it's a good idea if your code looks and sounds like the way people talk about the domain. Like the more your code sounds different from the domain, the more chances you have that there are misunderstandings and issues. So I tend to strive for that. And one good way to uh, to uh, one good approach for that is like if your code should represent the domain, like starts from the domain, and so maybe get artifacts from the business, like do things like get a report, uh, look at the documents people actually produce. And just looking at the sections, at the titles, how the documents are broken down, what names people use, what is similar and what is different, will give you a lot of hints on how people talk about the domain, and that's a good starting point. So let's do this, and let's look a bit at the actions here. So if I look at the actions, uh, I'm, I'm going to read, actually, I have it here. I think I have two actions. In the section actions, I have scimitar, melee weapon attack, plus four to hit, reach, blah, 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 short bow, ranged weapon, blah, blah, blah. So I see a couple of problems here. Like, uh, I'm not necessarily going to use it uh, in this talk, but like, just by looking at the language, you can see that you will probably have some problems with domain modeling because the language is a mess. The section was called actions. What I see is a scimitar. A scimitar or a bow is not an action. It's a thing. 
Uh, so a weapon is not an attack. Like a, a, again, like a bow is not an attack. A bow is a bow. The correct statement, which is implicit in the document, is something more complex. It's saying you can, as an action, you can make an attack, and to do an attack, you can actually use a weapon. So uh, what I'm pointing at here is like just by looking at the document, you can sense that some things are going to be a bit complicated because people talk about it in a way which is ambiguous. Let's ignore that for a second, and let's start to dive in into the two attacks we have on the goblin side block. So we have a scimitar, melee weapon, uh, we have hits, we have slashing damage, we have short bow, blah, blah, blah. If I look at these two things, there is an obvious parallelism, right? It's like these two things are not quite identical, but they follow a certain pattern. And the pattern I see here is that if I put them side by side, I'm going to see that one of them is called scimitar, short bow, that's a name. I have a melee weapon attack, range weapon attack. So the common structure, it looks to me like whenever I have an attack, like each of them has this and this and this and this. So what I'm probably after to model an attack is a record. So I'm going to start there. Now, if I, if I keep diving into it, I'm going to see also that in, in spite of the parallelism, I have places where things start to break apart. And uh, they break apart into a second row, is like one of them has a melee attack and the other, the other one has a ranged attack. These are different, so the way I would read it is like an attack can be either melee or ranged. That's a good hint that I should probably use a discriminated union. I see that uh, also the scimitar has a reach of 5 feet, this one has a reach of 80, 320 feet. It's different, I also hear like or, probably discriminated union again. I see that the, the damage I do can be slashing or piercing, these are also different, so it could be slashing or piercing, so probably a discriminated union. So let's try to use that and dive in into the melee and the range question. So looking back at the player handbook, page 146, every weapon is classified as either a melee or ranged. A melee weapon is used to attack a target within five feet. A ranged weapon is used to attack a target at a distance. Also, like here, we don't have an or, but we have an either. Either is also a good uh, indication that it's probably a discriminated union. So diving in a bit further, uh, if I look at the ranged for a ranged attack, a weapon that can be used to make a ranged attack has a range in parentheses. The range has two numbers. The first one is like the normal range. The second one is the weapon long range. If I use a bow, I can uh, shoot short or I can shoot very far. So how would you go about this? Uh, so right now what I have is I have something like this. My attack looks like a record. Currently, tentatively, I have a description which is a string, like scimitar or something else. I have something which is maybe a type of attack, like a melee or ranged attack. I have hit bonus, I have things, and I have a reach, and the reach could be either 5 feet or could be 80 and 320 feet for melee or ranged attacks. So this allows me to introduce another thing about uh, discriminated unions. Like so far, I just show them as cases that can enum. As it turns out, it's like, uh, the power comes in when you realize that you can attach data to each of the branches of a discriminated union. So here, what I can say is that a weapon can ha has a reach, and the reach can take one of two shapes. First shape, it's a melee attack. If it's a melee attack, I have a distance of five feet. If it's not a melee attack, it has to be a ranged attack, which has two numbers. One of them is a, low, a short range, and the other one is a long range. And now I can model my attack, saying the reach is a reach, which can be this or this. Good. I, I can do a bit better. Because having like, uh, so first, like the way I would use it is like I could use pattern matching, and with pattern matching, I can start to look at the shapes and extract the data. For instance, if I give you a ranged attack uh, and I wanted to know the distance, what I would do is I would say, uh, What's the reach? You give me an attack. I know that the reach can take one of two shapes. If it's a melee attack, I have only one number, that's the range, so I'm going to give you that back. And if I have a ranged attack, it can be I have two numbers, the short one and the long one, I'm going to give you back the long one. So I can now have two shapes, and I can extract the data the way I want. This is a bit dirty, like uh, two poles are a bit uh, not very expressive, so I can do a bit better. I can really say, like, for, uh, uh, like, how do I know which one is the short one and the long one? So to make this a bit nicer, I could say, let's create a record, and for, I can create a ranged reach with the short range and long range, and now I can do something like this, and I can replace now a ranged reach, and I, I can reach reach.long instead of just taking uh, the, uh, the one which is in second position. So this is nicer. I can use modules to make this even a bit nicer, Range reach is a bit of a long variable name, or a bit, uh, it's a bit ugly. So I could say uh, I'm going to have a module, which I'm going to use as a namespace. The module ranged is going to uh, contain what I call the reach in the context of ranged, and now I could say ranged of range.reach. So much nicer, it's getting cleaner and cleaner. So, so this is good. Like uh, with the, the work we did so far, it was pretty painless. 
And now we have a decent model. Like um, if I look at the scimitar example I had and the short bow example I had, I can represent, uh, represent them using the data structure. I have a problem though, which is I can do what I want, but I, I, I can also do things which I don't want to do. Uh, this way, I can create a chimera, like a creature, which is a combination of uh, monstrosities. And here, one thing you can do is I can create a weapon or an attack or what. And that attack could be of type melee, that I allowed it. But I can also give it a range, reach, which is range of short and long. This makes no sense, because uh, if it's a melee attack, it should have only one range. And if it's a ranged attack, it should have the two things. Here, I can create, uh, I can create either a short, yeah, I can create something which should never, ever exist. So I could handle it by uh, uh, doing uh, maybe try-catch blocks or stuff like that. This is not very pleasant. Uh, so there is a mantra which uh, keeps uh, popping up on the, uh, in the functional communities or statically typed functional communities, which is like make impossible states unrepresentable. Uh, one, one way to approach the problem is like uh, let people create problems and then deal with the problem. A much, a much more effective way to handle this is say make it impossible for the problem to happen even in the first place. If it's not possible to have the problem, you don't need to deal with it and everybody's happier. Usually you're going to see that you have this type of problem uh, in your code base when you see that you do pattern matches and you start to have like try-catch or like uh, exceptions. This is probably a sign that you're missing something and you can uh, if you're lucky, you can make the impossible state go away. So how do we do this here? We do this here by realizing that really we have a type which is melee and range, and we have a reach which is a melee or range. Really, there is one of the fields I don't need. Because like, uh, what I could do is I could just remove the type, and I could say the reach is either a ranged reach or a melee reach. And now, it's like uh, trivially, I know that the weapon is either melee or reached. I just need to look at the reach. So I remove the type, and now the only thing you can create is a weapon which is ranged with a proper range or melee with uh, just one range. So good. Problem gone. I cannot create, ca create camera anymore, and I can move on with my life happily. So. Uh, so this was the approach I followed initially, trying to model the character sheets, worked pretty well. I wanted to talk maybe about a couple of pitfalls or a couple of things you might encounter and like how you might want to uh, handle them. And uh, my naive assumption also was that like, uh, all these things should be pretty easy because unlike most software engineering projects where you don't have a specification, I have a full specification. So I could just look at the rules. And looking at the rules, I would know exactly how to implement it. It should, it should not be difficult. As it turned out, it was a bit uh, more complicated than anticipated. And one of the reasons is uh, the rules are full of uh, lies or are full of uh, half-truth. So let's look a bit at the type of half-truth you can find in documentation, which you find also in business projects. So uh, if I go back to uh, my starting point was the goblin attack. So I looked at these, and these are pretty similar. So based on this, I would think, like, fine, every attack follows this pattern. And then you go happily, and uh, you go to the monster manual, and at some point, you go to a creature called a wyvern. And so a wyvern, if you haven't seen a wyvern before, first is good because uh, then you're alive, but a wyvern is like a, a smaller version of a dragon. And uh, if you look at the actions a wyvern can take, an action, a wyvern can attack. And the attack is uh, pretty complicated compared to what we saw. Uh, the attack can be with a stinger, so that's its tail. It's a melee weapon attack. Uh, the range is now 10 feet. So that's a straight up lie. I mentioned before, from the rules, a melee attack should always be 5 feet. This is not what we're seeing here. The and uh, now it, it does one type of damage, piercing damage, and you have this whole block here. The target must make a DC 15 constitution saving throw, taking poison damage or fail safe. So it's saying, like, also when it attacks, you need to roll a dice. If you're unlucky, you're taking a lot of poison damage. If you're lucky, you're going to be able to take less damage. This is more complicated than, that we, than what we saw. Yeah, first statement is that when people tell you something is true, uh, they don't mean it. What they mean is that it's usually true. So that's a statement about reach of 10 feet. The rule says explicitly melee 5 feet. This is not what we have. We have 10 feet. So never believe people when they tell you it's true, unless they're a mathematician. The second one is uh, uh, one question to ask on your model is like one or at least one. My assumption when I looked at the goblin was uh, an attack has a type of damage and it's unique. Here what I see is I have piercing damage and I have poison damage. It's not particularly complicated, I can handle it, but uh, the way I would handle it would be to say fine. If I have more than one damage, what I'm going to do is the attack is going to have like, not one damage, but a list of damage. And my damage now is going to be what type of damage I do, like 1d6, 1d10, and what type of damage. So now I can say like my creature can attack and do poison damage with this and can also do this and that. Somebody pointed out that this is a bit problematic because with this model, I can also have an empty list, so I could create an attack which creates no damage. This is correct. 
uh, I didn't handle it because I was lazy, but like, uh, if I were less lazy, I would need to create a list which cannot be empty. The other one, so uh, at least one, the other one is like maybe one. So what we have here is like sometimes uh, attacks will have, uh, in some particular cases, uh, attacks will have like maybe more fancy features. Like in this case, beyond the standard stuff, I have the DC15 constitution saving throw. That will happen in some cases. In most cases, it won't. How would I represent this? I would typically use something which is called an option type. You can think of it as a nullable. So here I'm saying like some of the attacks are going to have special stuff. Special stuff is going to be an option. The option could be none, there is nothing special about the attack, or some, like you will have a GC saving throw and that type of thing. Another point I found like, when I was trying to model this was uh, I did initially a mistake. So I looked at the rules, and if you look at the rules on weapons, you will see the following. A weapon can be heavy. When it's heavy, it's too large for a small creature to handle. And a weapon can be light, and a light weapon is small and easy to handle. If you look at this, you say easy peasy. Of course, I'm going to use a discriminated union. I'm going to create a type which is called weight. The weight is either light or heavy. And now it's like every weapon can be light or heavy, and we're good. As it turns out, we are not. Uh, so uh, a discriminated union uh, needs to tell you the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth. Another way to say this is that it's mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, meaning uh, a thing has to be in one of the buckets. It, can be, uh, it cannot be in more than one bucket, but it must be in one of the buckets. And in this case, I have a problem because a weapon can be light, can be heavy, or can be none of these things. Some of the weapons are neither light nor heavy. So this is not a good fit because uh, uh, my, uh, my DU doesn't represent this properly. So I kind of have like two ways to uh, handle it. The first one would be to use the same tip as before. I could say some weapons are going to have neither light nor heavy, so that's the case I have here. I would use an option and say either I have none of these things or some of uh, one of the two things, light or heavy, that would work. The other one would be I could create a third case which is not documented anywhere, and I could say a weapon has to be light, medium or heavy. Both are valid and have kind of pluses and minuses. I would say like the, one, the first one with none or some is more correct, uh, in a certain sense, because uh, it's really... Uh, the thing I don't like about the second one is that like, the second one is creating something which doesn't exist in the domain. If you look in the PHB, nothing knows... Uh, you will not find like a medium weapon. That doesn't exist. So I'm creating language which is not reflecting the rules. I don't like that. At the same time, the second one has a benefit, is that like, it's much easier to use. I can just like do match, is it light, is it medium, is it heavy? It's very straightforward. The, the case here is more like uh, if it's none, do nothing. If it's something, then I need to ask, is it light, is it heavy? So it's a bit deeper. So I would say like in this case, it's a matter of taste. It depends a bit on uh, whether you prefer to uh, be absolutely true and correct in representation, but has a bit of a cost on how you use it, or that like, you want to be like, uh, you're okay with uh, being lying a bit uh, for the sake of comfort. The uh, last one which you need to keep in mind when you work with the discriminated unions is, is it really closed? Uh, I will give an example. Like if you look at the rules, you will find a very long list of the weapons which exist in Dungeons and Dragons. You have short bows, long bows, scimitars, this and that. And so one thing you could do is you could say, every weapon is going to be a case in my discriminated union. The problem with that is like a discriminated union, the point of it is that it's closed. Like you know that a weapon has to be one of these things. Uh, another way to say this is like if you ever, ever want to do a new weapon which is not in the rules, it's not possible because the, by whole design, the DU is meant to, uh, to be closed. So if you know that it's possible that you might want to extend your domain and add new things to the category, you don't want to use a DU, this is going to bite you. Like, this doesn't work. So in other words, like, uh, when you do the type of exercise I was describing, is like some questions you might want to think about is, like, uh, is it one or is it at least one type of damage? Is it one or is it maybe one? Like I might have like special type of damage. Uh, is the thing closed or, uh, or is it possible that sometimes somebody will want to extend the thing? And do I have all the cases covered that might happen in my domain? One thing I also really liked about this approach is that all I did here was I talked about two things, record and discriminated unions. Uh, I really like this, so uh, sometimes like functional programming has this reputation of being a bit complicated. Uh, personally, first, like, if I go back to my uh, old days, is like uh, one thing I, I remember hearing was that like, uh, you should use composition over inheritance. This is exactly what I'm doing here. I'm not using any inheritance. All I'm doing is I'm composing together discriminated unions and records. Like, that's all I need. And uh, this is, uh, so this is very refreshing, right? It's, like, uh, it's extremely simple. I look at something and I ask, is it a record? Is it a DU? And then I keep going and going and going, and at some point I'm finished. So I find like, this actually uh, refreshingly uh, simple. 
Cool, so now let's move into a different question, which is like, how do you model dice rolls? So uh, if I go back to the short bow, uh, in the manual you will see something like this. To uh, compute the damage for a short bow, run like 1d6 and add 2. So uh, dice are everywhere in Dungeons and Dragons. I, I have my dice set here, like you have dice 20, you have dice 8, 8 sided, 10, uh, 10 sided, 12, uh, and, and so on and so forth. They are everywhere, and this is how you resolve every situation. So uh, going back to the question of the ubiquitous language, what I would like is I would like to be able to represent dice rolls cleanly in my model. If it's important, I should be able to model it. I would want to be able to do something like this. So given the limitation of syntax and what I can do, I will probably never be able to write code like this. That won't quite work. What I want to do is to see how close I can get to that. And to get to that is like in my journeys uh, across the realms, is like I ended up like uh, meeting a legendary half-elf wizard uh, called Thomas. And uh, I highly recommend like, looking what he's doing. And so one of the things I picked up was like in lots of uh, his code or his talks, you end up seeing things like, uh, let's create expressions using discriminated unions to represent our problem. And so I thought, maybe I should be using this here. Uh, so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to express something like this. I'm trying to say damage could be maybe 4d10 plus 2d6 plus 4. If you look at it carefully, this is an expression. That expression could be arbitrarily complex. I could say the damage is going to be 4. I could say the damage is going to be 2d10. I could say the damage is going to be 5d10 plus 2d6 plus 4 plus 7d3. So it's an expression which could be extremely simple, extremely complex, and I want to represent that. Uh, if you look at this too, you can uh, realize that there are really three things happening here. I have like two base components. The first one is a dice roll. Like 4d10 is really telling me, take a d10, roll it four times. The second one I see is like 4. 4 is an integer, so I have integer values. And the composition I can use to create more complex expressions is addition. I can add dice rolls, I can add integers, and I can compute more. I can create more and more complex uh, dice rolls. Cool, so let's do that and see how that, uh, that would look out. So I'm going to go now to, uh, I'm going to, go now to code, and uh, let's see if I can make that happen. So, uh, so my goal is to, is it big enough for everybody in the back? Cool. So my goal is to uh, represent expressions along the lines of damage equals 6d10 plus 4 plus 2d6. So first thing I'm going to do is like if I want to do dice rolls, let's try to look at uh, how would I create a dice. One trick you're going to find often is the idea of a single case discriminated union. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily the most uh, obvious idea, but because usually you use discriminated unions for multiple cases, but one thing you can say is you can say a dice is going, is going to be one case, is going to be D of end. So why is this so useful? Is because now I can start to create dice. I can do something like D4, which is going to construct a dice, which is D4. Or I can do D6, which is going to be a D6. So not particularly uh, complicated, but now it's like a first problem is gone. It's like I have a, a D10, D6, D4 taken out of the way. And now let's go into the piece which is a bit more meaty or a bit more complicated, which is the expressions about dice rolls. So if it's a, a dice roll expression, let's call that a dice roll. And what I described in the dice roll is like a dice roll really has three things. I can either have a roll of dice, I can have like values which are integers, or I can have addition of multiple things together. Let's do this with a discriminated union. So the first one is going to be, uh, let's say, a roll of, and so what do I have in a roll is I need two things. I need to know how many dice I'm rolling, and I need to know what dice I'm rolling. Fine. The second case, so now is like I should be able to do something like this. I should be able to do a roll for d6. And beautiful, I have a dice roll which is perfectly defined. So this is good. Uh, one of the cases are covered. Second case I need to cover is like uh, I have something like a dice roll could be five, could be like uh, in the values I have also straight up values. How about I create just this? A value could be a value which is going to just contain an integer. So now I'm going to run this again. And now I can do something like, so I can, this is a roll and I can have a value of four. So now this is a also a dice roll, so it means like a dice roll can be one of these two things. I'm missing the third case, and the third case was like uh, what I can do with these things is I can combine dice rolls by adding them together. How would I do that? Well, we're going to add just one case, and I'm going to say an addition is going to contain potentially uh, addition is like I'm adding a list of things together. So I'm going to say how about I create a list, and the list is going to be a list of dice rolls. 
Note that this is kind of interesting because like, this data structure is kind of recursive. What this is saying is that like, a dice roll can be uh, the addition of dice rolls, which can be the addition of dice rolls. So it's like this is how I know that this thing can be extended as far as I want. So how would I use this now? Is that like, I could do something like this. I could do something like, uh, well, I could, uh, for instance, do uh, add this and this. And if I did my job properly, this should be a completely correctly formed dice roll. And this doesn't work because I haven't run this yet. And sure enough, like this is telling me like adding a 46 and a value of 10 is a valid dice roll. So uh, this is like uh, at that point, it's like we pretty much model like dice rolls uh, to the, its all complexity. Like I can uh, I can extend this and I can now add uh, maybe a roll of like 10 d20 and I, ca I can keep going. So it's like I can just compose as much as I want. Like my expressions are fully modeled. Uh, throw any dice roll at me, I know I can represent it. The piece which is not making me very happy is like uh, uh, what I wanted was something which looked like this, 6d10 plus 4 plus 2d6. What I have is like functionally doing the same, but it's kind of ugly. Like uh, it's not looking quite as nice as uh, what I wanted. So how about we do that now and try to uh, refine a bit and make things a bit cleaner. So first thing I can do is I can actually create like uh, instances and I could say like how about I call a d4 something which is a d4 and how about I call a d6 something which is a d6, and let's uh, d8 equals d8. And I'm going to leave it at that, so I, like, uh, I leave to the reader the exercise of finishing like, all the possible dice rolls. But so now I have like, dice rolls, and so what I should be able to do now is something like add uh, roll, roll for d6 with a value uh, of uh, 1. Uh, why is this not happy? Yeah, that's good. So now it's like if I run this, it's like this is also a valid expression. So this is already a bit nicer. I'm starting to get this shorter. But uh, the, uh, the piece which is not very nice is like this whole add with the brackets is kind of uh, ugly. Uh, so how would uh, you fix this? Well, one thing I didn't realize initially, it took me uh, literally two years after I knew about discriminated unions, that you can actually add uh, methods and properties to a discriminated union. So this is kind of nice. So I'm going to do this right now. And uh, uh, so what I want is like I want to be able to do instead of add roll d 46 and value of one, I would want to be able to write something like this. Let's remove this. And I, what my goal now is going to be to do something like 4d6 plus value of one. That would be a bit nicer. Now it doesn't work because it doesn't know how addition works. Fine. I'm going to add then addition to my discriminated union. So I'm going to do like a member, static member. Plus, and here I'm going to say like the two things I can add is I can add a first roll, which is going to be a dice roll, and I can add the second roll, which is going to be a dice roll as well. And the way I'm going to do this is very simple. It's like if you give me two dice rolls, is like what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply return to you the addition of these two things, roll one and roll two. And so let's check that this works out. So I'm going to run this. I mean, you can already see probably that it works because if I go down in my code now, it's like suddenly the compiler is happy and it's telling me, yes, it works. So I can do roll 46 plus value of 6, and sure enough, it's working. So now this is already much nicer. I'm starting to fleshing things out. Now, if I look at this, it's like the second point which is offensive to my eyes is like value of 1. Like uh, what I would really like to say is like uh, add just uh, 46 plus 1. How about we do this? So this is where this idea of adding methods is useful, because uh, normally with, a, with an F-sharp function, it can have only a unique signature. You don't have overloads. You don't have any of these things. Methods don't have that problem. So I can create as many overloads as I want. So let's do this. So what I want is I want still a static member plus. But uh, what I want to say now is that like, the first thing I'm going to give you is a dice roll. But the second thing is going to be a value x. That thing is going to be actually an integer. And what would I do with this is like uh, I would now give you still addition of the first roll, but here I'm going to wrap this up into a value which is going to contain x. So now I'm taking the integer, putting it into a value, and now everything is happy and it's going to give me back an expression which is well formed. So let's do this and let's see if that works out. So now if I go down, what I should be able to see is that, uh, do is that I should be able to remove value here and it should work. And sure enough, the compiler is happy. Let's make sure that uh, everything works, and it works. Progress. The piece which doesn't work is the opposite. It's like 1 plus a roll of 4 d6, or d5. Well, d5 doesn't exist, but d6. And so here, like, what I need to do is that I need to do the opposite. Like, uh, let's create quickly a second overload. And the second overload is going to be now, uh, instead of roll 1 and x, I'm going to do x is an integer. 
and roll one is going to be a dice roll. And actually, I should be able to uh, keep even that code that should just work. And now if I look, sorry, let's do all of this. And now if I look at all of this and I go down, is like, again, the compiler is like, completely placated. And it tells me that, yep, you can directly add this. And it's going to give me a fully formed role with uh, all the nice things. So at that point, we're like, much, much closer, much closer to, uh, to what we wanted. Right? Like, the only thing which is uh, missing at that point is maybe uh, role 4d6. Like, it would be nice if I could make that a bit better. What I want to do is I would want to be able to write something like, uh, so this I did. Ideally, I would want to write something like 4d6 plus 2. So 4d6 plus 2 is not really going to work out because like, uh, I cannot really write a variable starting with a number. So that's probably not going to work. Uh, what's the second best thing I could do? Uh, even if I describe uh, 4d6, what I'm really saying is like run a, a d6 four times. So one thing I could do is I could say like 2 times d6. 2 times d6 or 4 times d6. And if I had this, is like then I would probably be as close as I want to uh, the goal I was after. So, uh, so that's not very complicated to do. Here, I would also use uh, uh, this one. Actually, will need to be added to the dice because what I'm recreating is like a dice roll. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a static number, uh, and this is going to be. Uh, I'm blanking now. Uh, yeah, that would be a multiplication. And what I'm saying is like I would want you to know how to take a number. So, it's like that's going to be times is going to be an int, and the second thing is going to be dice. Uh, the, uh, the dice is going to be dice. And so if I have this, is like what I want is I want to represent, uh, I want to uh, return back a roll, which is going to be a roll of times the dice. So now this is not working out because the issue here is like the dice, the roll is not defined yet because the roll is defined inside here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the two types like uh, know about each other. And so now uh, what I should be able to do is I should be able to do all of this. And I'm going to write like a nice complicated expression with dice at the bottom. Actually, I can see it already with the compiler. So now at that point, I, I can do something like plus 4, plus uh, 10 times d4. And I uh, why are you not happy? This works. So now, like this thing here is a fully formed dice roll, and it's like probably as close as I could get it to uh, the, the thing I wanted. And now this is nice because I can start plug plugging this in into my code, like, uh, and I can uh, wh where I had damage, I can start to plug that in. It's going to look exactly like the way I talk about it. So the last piece of the pattern is usually when you uh, the, the question is how would you use this? Typically, what you would end up doing is like uh, doing something like an eval function. And the eval, uh, if I wanted, for instance, to resolve a dice roll, what I would do is I would say uh, I would do something. I'm not going to write it from scratch for the sake of time. So I'm just going to run like this code here. And I'm going to show you like how the eval would look like. Let me do this. And if I wanted to evaluate a dice roll, is like all I need to do is I need essentially to walk down the, the pattern and do the right thing. So if you give me a dice roll and I want to evaluate it, the roll can be one of three things. It can be a value. If I told you like the damage is four, I'm just going to give you four. The second thing, it can be a roll, like four times uh, d6. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create four times d6, and for each of them, I'm going to run a random number, and I'm going to uh, return to you the sum. And the third one is like if you give me multiple rolls, I'm simply going to run them, evaluate them, and give you like the total. And so now what I should be able to do is like something like this. I should be able to evaluate this, and if I run it over and over and over again, I'm seeing like the numbers are maybe plausible. I don't know if this is right, but like this is now running like any dice roll I might want to throw at it. Or I can do this. For d10 plus 2 plus d12 plus 2, pop, and again, I can run it. And so now I have a beautiful like a dice evaluator. Cool. So let's go back to the slide for a minute. So what did I show here? It's like what I did is like uh, I had a problem. What I created was an internal domain-specific language, which is recreating really expressions by uh, saying I have dice. Let's model dice. Let's model dice roll as a recursive type. And now I have something which is not looking good, but which is representing technically exactly what I want. And then the next step, I created an evaluator so that I can now consume this and do things with it. And the overall pattern is like first, think about the expression, build something, don't focus for this to be, uh, the point is not to be nice or elegant, the point is to be correct. And once this is correct, start to use tricks so that it goes from correct to a nice. Like make it clean by using either overloads of methods or by using also functions which are going to help you construct 
extract the objects you want. So this is kind of a, a pattern I see all over. The thing which is interesting too is that like in my C-sharp days, I would never ever have thought about doing something like this. Like building expressions and parsing them is a bit unpleasant. Uh, like DUs make that absolutely trivial. And I see that every code base I have like, uh, has uh, some form of this somewhere. Uh, I uh, moved my blog like, from a SQL to a Markdown. I ended up doing a model which was how do I represent a page? I did that with expressions. And then I moved things from this to this. I did this to uh, do something like an Excel evaluation engine for like, a company I was working for. So it pops up like, all over the place. Like, it's surprisingly easy uh, how you can create expressions and like, work with them. Cool. So now I'm going to go to the last part uh, of uh, our adventure. And uh, it's going to be about Fable Elmish and modeling like, combat in Fable Elmish. So I initially, my first goal was to model uh, creatures, but really the, the uh, ultimate goal I had was uh, I would like to be able to design fair fights in my D&D campaign. Uh, the reason this was a problem for me was the first time I played with my friends, I was the DM, I created an encounter, uh, and within 15 minutes, I nearly killed everybody. So this is not the best, uh, most enjoyable experience in a game. And so that made me wonder, is like, how do I know that a fight, uh, should I give them like five goblins, 20, two, should I put more wolves? How do I do that? So uh, what is a fair fight is like essentially what I want is like uh, if the players uh, don't do anything stupid, if the creatures behave reasonably, what I would want is like I would want to know that the probability that everybody dies is maybe 5%, maybe 10%, like there should be a risk, but I should be able to know what the risk is. Uh, from my background, is like a, a kind of like simulation, so I thought one way to do that would be fine, is like I'm going to uh, take a setup, like maybe take the players, take the goblins, and run a million fights. To make that work, is I need two things. I need to have the rules of the game implemented. If I don't have the rules uh, in the code, I cannot run a simulation. The second thing I need is like if I want this to be automated, I also need the goblins to make not silly decisions. I need every creature to be uh, somewhat smart. So I need to implement the rules, and I need an automation, uh, automated decision-making engine. So what type of decisions do you make uh, in a combat in Dungeons and Dragons? PHB, on your turn, you can move and you can take an action. So one way you, uh, in practice, what this means is that when it is your turn, suppose you have 20 feet of movement, you can move north, five feet, move west, attack, move north, and say, I'm done. That's the type of thing you can do. So you can move as long as you have movement, and any time in there you can take an action, which would be, for instance, an attack. Modeling is pretty straightforward. I can take two actions, either move in a certain direction or attack a certain creature with a certain weapon. Uh, to know what happens, I probably need state. Like if you told me you wanted to do this, I need to know a couple of things. I need to know what creatures exist and maybe how, how much life they have, where they are. I need to know who's playing now. Like, uh, is it your turn? And I need to know also, like, what's the order in which creatures can make decisions. And so if I have this, what I would write is something like an update function. If you give me the state, like uh, where the creatures are, if you give me a message, like what creature is acting and what is it that they are doing, then I need to do two things. First is like, uh, is it valid? Like, uh, is it your turn? If creature two is, asked, is uh, acting, but it's creature one turn, I should refuse that. So I need to do some validation. Uh, assuming it's valid, I'm going to then look at the action. If you move, I'm going to uh, update the state and give you back the state. If you attack, I'm going to update the state and give you back the state. And if I have that, I can do something along these lines. Like I can have a list of commands, which are like uh, what you can do. I can take the state and apply all the commands and update the state uh, after each of the commands. If you have done something like uh, event sourcing before, like this should look quite familiar. So the, uh, like F-sharp and distributed unions uh, lend them really well into this type of uh, uh, model where you apply action after action after action and see how it transforms the world. Cool. So I was doing this like in code. And I was looking at the results like the way I was showing you before in VS Code. And this is nice, but this is not the best way to see what's happening, especially if you want to uh, see movement. Like you have to look at the coordinates. Like this is kind of annoying. Uh, first, oh yeah, first is like uh, you might have picked that I missed something here. If you remember, uh, one of the things on discriminated unions is that like, uh, it should cover every possible case. With the model I have so far, I have one issue, which is that like, if, uh, if you have like 20 feet of movement, you will stop only when you have done all your movement. In other words, is like with the model I have now, I'm forcing you to take all the actions you could take. I'm not letting you do something like, I don't want to play, I'm done. So I was missing one case, which is I can move, I can attack, I can tell you I'm done. So this is uh, another case where like, uh, uh, you need to think a bit about, am I covering every case? That being said, so uh, what I wanted at that point was, uh, can I uh, represent things in a UI so that I can see what's going on in my game? And uh, at the time, uh, there was a project which was get, uh, get picking up a lot of steam. So actually, two projects. One of them was Fable. 
Fable is awesome. So what Fable is is like a F# -sharp to JavaScript transpiler. Like take F# -sharp code, do the JavaScript. This is great because I don't know anything about JavaScript. I don't want to deal with it. So I thought let's look at this. The second piece is like Elmish. So Elmish is an implementation on Fable of a pattern coming from the language Elm. And in a nutshell, uh, Elm uh, uh, was proposing the following model for an application, the uh, model view update pattern. So uh, the model view update pattern says, essentially, uh, if you have a state, that would be your model. First, I need an init function, which is going to give me the initial state. Once I have a state, I'm going to receive messages. This is what you can do in the application. Every time a message comes in, I'm going to call the update function, which is going to update the state, message, update the state, and so on and so forth. And another thing is going to look at the model, and every time the model changes, I'm going to render it uh, in the UI. So pretty easy to implement, and it turns out it's also a beautiful fit with, uh, with the, uh, the type of pattern I was showing here. So let me show you a bit like my pride and joy, my first web app, uh, and uh, like, uh, show you like, how the simulator looks like. So this is like a purely F# -sharp code. Like this is my application. I have like four files. It's about like 2,000 lines of code. And uh, what you do with this is like I'm going to go here and I'm going to say npm start. This is what I like. Is like uh, I never did JavaScript, and now I feel like I'm a full stack developer. I'm using npm, I'm using Webpack, and all these things. And so now what this is doing is taking the F# -sharp code. It's compiling into JavaScript. So now the compilation is happening. And uh, once this is going to be done, which should be done in a couple of seconds, so the first pass is usually a bit slow. But so compiling, 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 very good. And now if I go here, I should be able to do something like localhost 8080. And what I will see, so I mentioned that I was not a, a web developer or UI developer. So this is arguably uh, the ugliest uh, UI you have seen in a while. But like, uh, what I'm showing here is like, uh, so now my application is running. So what I see here is I see a field where I have a couple of creatures. I have like three creatures in blue, which are like wolves. So I have a wolf here, uh, three wolves, and I have three goblins here. And, uh, and on the right, I'm showing like, uh, so the state of the world, and I'm showing like uh, now creature zero is uh, up and can do a couple of things. It can move north, 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 or it could attack the first wolf. And on the side, I'm seeing the journal of everything which is happening. So I can see that the, the goblin attempted an attack, which was attacking with a short bow, and it failed. And so now it's going to finish its turn. And then the uh, other one is going to move north, and it's going to attack, maybe, or finish its turn. And the third one is going to do something. So now, this is obviously, like, this is the worst possible way to play Dungeons and Dragons, right? I started with, uh, you want stories, you want uh, all of this. And I showed you like, the, uh, the uh, horrible UI. My goal here was I can switch to a different mode, which is uh, switch to automated. And so now what it's going to do is going to take my three wolves, my three goblins, and they're going to fight each other to death. So now it's like, uh, lots of things are happening. It looks like the wolves are absolutely creaming the goblins. So I could uh, start it again, maybe restart, because like one game is maybe not, uh, not enough. So I'm going to do another one. Bam, a, a goblin is already dead. Second one is already destroyed. The wolves are doing pretty good. Let's do a last one. Yep, OK, let's do a last one, see if maybe the goblins do a bit better. But so this is kind of what I wanted, right? Like the, uh, what I want is like I want to be able to simulate this like over and over and over again. And if I play it one million times, I will have a good idea of like in general if the wolves win 95% of the times. Uh, this is uh, giving you, yeah, and it looks like again like the goblins are getting destroyed. So uh, so this is a tele like me, this is where I would uh, I would start to estimate the probability and all of that. So cool. So uh, I was very happy with this. Like, yeah. So, uh, so le let me go back to a couple of points about this, like talking about how it's built and a couple of uh, things uh, in, uh, in this behind this application. So one thing which is difficult about the automated de decision making is like my bigger problem is like a uh, first problem is like what should the goblin do? Uh, a, a problem uh, before that is like what what is a goblin allowed to do in a particular term? And uh, that's important because uh, maybe I cannot move north. So if I give you the opportunity to go north, then what I need to do is I need to validate, can you do this move? This is complicated. This is a bit of a pain. It would be much nicer if I knew what a creature could do. So this is where I remembered another journey. And a creature uh, I uh, met was a, a legendary gnome droid, uh, Scott Vlashen. I also recommend uh, his work. And in a talk uh, he gave a long time ago, he talked about uh, enterprise tic-tac-toe, a very important topic. And uh, uh, one idea I brought up was the idea of uh, capability-based testing, which was like uh, uh, the context was security. Like you can handle security two ways. One way is like let people do things and then check if they're allowed to do it. That's complicated. An easier way to do this would be uh, give people only uh, the actions they can perform, and then you don't have to validate. You give them like what they could do, they do it. Validation is gone. So I thought maybe I can do that here, and that's what I did. The idea is like given the state and given the creature, I can pre-generate based on the rules everything the creature can do. 
This is useful because at that point, I can model the decision. I can say, fine, now the turn of the creature is creature one. They can do this, this, or this. And now it's like my validation is trivial. Like If you give me a command where it's not the right creature or the command is not in the list of actions you can do, you're out. Validation is done. And the other reason it's useful is now I can also put it into a decision model. So the way the, when I switch to automatic, what happened is that I added a small component in my uh, Elmish application, which is a mailbox processor or an agent. So what's happening here is like any time there is an update, I'm looking at the state, I'm, cr I'm uh, checking like, who is allowed to act, what are they allowed to do. I send it to, to the decide agent. That agent is looking at this, it knows exactly what to do. So at that point, the only problem is that you gave me five things I can do, which one should I pick? So now that makes it easy for me to start to do smart things. Uh, it's going to make a decision, pick one, and then it's going to create a message. So if you would update, and so now I have a loop which is going over and over and over again, and the game is playing against itself. So this is how this thing is built. Quick conclusion, or like a couple of points maybe as a conclusion here. Uh, first, is like, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is like I'm nowhere close to being done. So I was very naive. Like, of course, 1,000 pages of rules is a lot of thing uh, to do. So uh, I need to finish implementing the rules. Like a couple of things, uh, I need to implement magic. That's not done, but I'm not worried about it. I need to implement things like terrain. Uh, it's not necessarily complicated, but it's going to be fun. Like things like, can I see you? Are you hidden? Are you behind a pillar? So that should be fun. But the piece which I'm really, really struggling with right now is the, the idea of effects. Things like you have a buff, you have a debuff. Like for instance, uh, in the game, like there is a ruler around wolves. And when a wolf attacks, if an ally of the wolf is close to you, then the wolf is getting an advantage. This is extremely painful to represent. So I'm trying to represent these things where you have a global effect on the game, and uh, which gives advantages to some people. So I'm really struggling with this. If any, uh, anyone in the audience has idea on how to do this, I would be quite interested. Uh, what's missing? So right now, is like I showed you like the uh, goblins fighting the wolves and getting destroyed. The decisions they're making are not very smart. Uh, I want to make something smarter, so this is where I'm going back to my background on machine learning. What I would really like to do is uh, to use reinforcement learning. So if you don't know reinforcement learning, uh, this is the technique they use behind like AlphaGo and all this. Uh, reinforcement learning, the idea is they play a lot of games. Uh, try a bit of everything. Like you have five actions possible, try one, try another one, try another one. And over time, what you will see is like some decisions look like you always die, uh, some decisions like you always win. So over time, like do more of the things which work, uh, less of the things which don't work. And uh, in theory, if everything works right, in the end, you will have like smart goblins and smart wolves. So I don't know if that will work, but that's my, uh, that's my goal at that point. The third one is like uh, there's a point which is a bit in the back of my head, so that's more of a comment. Uh, I said in the beginning, like, uh, uh, I started, uh, so one excuse which software engineers uh, use often on a, when a project fails is like the excuse is like uh, the specifications were not clear, you didn't tell me everything about the domain. I don't have that excuse. If I take the rules, I read, read them like two hours later, I should be able to play the game, there is not much ambiguity. So it looks like I have everything I need, like it's a fully documented system, so it should be reasonably easy to do. I have been really struggling with this. And so I think like, uh, I, what I realize is like I think there is a difference between documentation and specification. Like the documentation or the rules are a really good document for a human to understand how you should play the game. They are horrible if you take this as read the page and see what to implement. I think, uh, some of the problems, some of the differences are around like uh, if you talk to a human, you're trying to get them to get a mental model as quickly as possible. And to do that is that you omit everything which is obvious context. Like if uh, you told me, uh, if I told you, uh, meet me uh, uh, somewhere, you have never seen me and meet me somewhere tomorrow, I'm not going to tell you I'm a human with a head, two legs and two arms. That's obvious. I'm going to tell you I'm tall, I'm wearing black, I'm going to tell you all, tell you all the specifics and none of the things which are the context. Uh, so when you do documentation, you tend to do this, like you talk about the things which are special about it, and you don't talk about uh, the things which are obvious. And so that, uh, that's the direction I see in the rules. Specifications are quite different, because when you implement, you need to know what the context is, and that's not in the rules. So I'm, uh, I'm still a bit uh, struggling with that and trying to understand like, how the two are different. Anyways, so this is what I had. So uh, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me in all these places. The code I have is like I'm doing it all live, so it's on GitHub under my name on Monster Vault. So you can see the, the progress, like my experimentations. I'm also trying to document this in my blog, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, my failures, and all of that. And uh, so this is what I had. So the last thing I will do is like because it's a D&D talk, is that like I'm going to thank you and cast bless, plus three on all your charisma checks. And uh, this is what I had. Thank you.